Hello from a very wet, very miserable part of the world, the west coast of Ireland in late September, early October. My name is Stephen Finucan. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. And for the past six years or so, I have been working on the OpenSec Compute project. The topic of my talk today is the magic of the live driver. So over the course of this talk, I'm hoping to to give a, a kind of very high level overview of what the Libvirt driver is, where it fits into OpenStack, and what the the implications of using the Libvirt driver are, particularly from the, the scheduling perspective. Um, the Libvirt driver has been around for maybe eight years or so now, and at this point, it is by far the most used, most widely spread driver that Nova offers. But because of just the sheer amount of complexity and features that it offers, it can be a, a tricky beast to, to, to operate effectively. So I'm hoping to, to look at some of the kind of issues that you would see when you're using a deployment with a typical, um, with your typical configuration, i.e. the deliberate driver, and how you can go about um, working around or resolving those issues. Before we get into any of that deep dive stuff, I think it would benefit us to have a quick recap of what OpenStack Nova is, uh, what the architecture of, o of Nova looks like, and where the Libvirt driver fits into that. So Nova's the compute project is responsible for managing the lifecycle of VMs or instances in OpenStack terms. And if you've ever read the Nova documentation, you'll have probably come across an image just like this one on the screen. There's kind of four main components with, uh, within Nova, uh, and there's a couple of external components that Nova relies on to, to handle things like images and um, authentication and so forth. But focusing on those four components, the four of them are the Nova API service, the scheduler service, the conductor service, and finally the compute service. The Libvirt driver, as we're going to see, uh, is a, a subcomponent of the last of these, the compute service, but its usage has implications for both uh, the API and the scheduler services, as well as the conductor service in, in a manner. Where Libvirt actually fits into this, or any Vert driver for that matter, into this diagram is in underneath the uh, Nova compute service. So the Nova compute service has uh, a manager, a compute manager, and that is communicated with via um, an RPC API from the Nova conductor service, and in some cases, other Nova compute services. So uh, you have that compute manager, and that talks to the vert driver, which is um, an abstraction of whatever your chosen hypervisor driver may be. And then you have a whole load of other stuff underneath there that from the Nova perspective, we tend to try and ignore wherever possible. Nova comes with a couple of different compute drivers. Uh, the Livra driver is by far the most widespread, widely used of those drivers. But um, Ironic, vCenter, so forth, um, these are all fully supported in tree. The Livra driver wasn't the original driver that Nova supported, that was the Zen API driver. That driver has been deprecated in the train release, as far as I can recall, and was finally removed over the course of the last cycle, which was the Victoria release cycle. Livert itself, of course, isn't actually a hypervisor. It's an abstraction layer itself over different hypervisors. And Nova offers the ability to configure the actual hypervisor that Livert is using. Again, there's a clear winner here. Um, which is the QMU and KVM accelerated QMU backends. Uh, those are the things that are used in the gates and those are the things that are used in the majority of deployments using the Liver Vert driver. I said earlier that from the Nova perspective, we tend to try and ignore everything below the Vert driver um, wherever possible. There's enough complexity to be dealing with in the higher levels, but for anyone that's interested, uh, a very high level overview of that black box, if you will. You have your Nova Livert daemon service, 
which uh, is responsible for starting up and managing a couple of QMU uh, ex uh, pro processes. Uh, again, assuming you're using the QMU backend and all of that sits and runs on top of a Linux kernel, Linux also is. What Livert expects is this big blob of XML. Uh, if you were to think about Nova for, in very simplistic terms, all that the Nova Compute Service is doing really is, uh, or most of the time anyway, is converting a request from a user into uh, just such a blob as this that it can feed into Livert. Does a lot more than that, obviously, but simplistic terms. And Livert then is, again, very, very simplistic terms, converting that XML into calls to the QMU um, executable and a couple of other things as well. Massive, massive simplification, but good enough for now. So what's so special about the Livert driver? Um, what's, what does it do that the other drivers don't do, particularly from the perspective of scheduling? And to be honest, it pretty much comes down to complexity. So the Livert driver, as I said at the top, is quite complex is the most feature complete of all of the virt drivers uh, supported in tree. And it, it, it could be a bit of a like a Rube Goldberg machine at times um, with a whole load of stuff that's been tacked on over the years, maybe not fully thought out, that kind of thing. Stuff that we are, in fairness, continually trying to clean up and improve and uh, refine, if you will. But complexity is unfortunately a component um, of or an aspect of dealing with the Livert driver, and I guess OpenStack as a whole. So my focus here is on um, not so much giving out about the Livert driver, because again, I, I help maintain this. Um, I, I don't want to give out about the thing. But where the kind of conditions that might cause um, this very famous no valid host ever, that uh, anyone that has ever operated in an OpenStack Cloud, we surely have seen all too many times. So that no valid host error is a thing that's raised by the scheduler. So it probably makes start and um, probably makes sense rather to start from there um, when we and analyze things from that perspective. So the Nova scheduler process is quite a, a simple service compared to the other services. It is responsible for taking a request from a user pass through like various other proxy services um, and going and finding a host that you can actually schedule instances on. So the way that it actually does this, there's a, kind of a three-step dance that's necessary. The first of those, once it's received the request from the user via other services, is to go and talk to placement. So any recent OpenStack release does exactly this. Placement for anyone that hasn't encountered it before is the inventory management, inventory tracking system within OpenStack. And that's responsible for tracking, for example, how many vCPUs, how much disk space, how much RAM is available on each given compute node or each given server within your, your data center. Placement will get a request from Nova Scheduler and it will return back a list of allocation candidates or places where it thinks Nova can schedule instances to. The scheduler then will filter these uh, based on criteria that perhaps placement doesn't understand. Uh, and then after it has filtered out the, the duds, if you will, it'll go and it'll weigh those and choose a clear favorite and then a couple of backup alternates that it can use in case scheduling to the, the clear favorite doesn't work out. So those three components, uh, that's how we're going to look at uh, the Livert driver and the implications of using the Livert driver from a scheduling perspective, um, because it's, it's a good way to do things. So starting from the top with the last of those components, the, the weighers. So there isn't actually a whole lot to say about these. Um, the Livert uh, driver doesn't really have any special bearing when it comes to weighers because weighers aren't really that complex. Uh, themselves. Weyers don't exclude hosts, they simply illustrate a preference for any given host. And as a result, uh, a bad misconfiguration of weyers 
will typically um, result in maybe poor scheduling decisions, but it won't result in, in your no valid host case. Nonetheless, there are three ways that do have some implications, the, the CPU, the RAM, and the PCI wear. Um, CPU wear, as the name would suggest, helps you either stack or spread on hosts, depending on the availability of CPUs. The RAM wear, again, the same for uh, RAM. And then finally, the PCI wear, which again, as you would suspect, is for PCI devices. I'm not gonna go into too many details yet because we're gonna cover each of these three topics uh, individually in a moment. But the, these can these can behave sometimes funkily uh, depending on how your liver driver is configured, and we'll see that in a moment. Placement is where things actually get interesting. So placement thinks about the world in terms of two things: resources and traits. Resources are something that a compute node has uh, multiples of and traits are something that a compute node is like is able to do. This is, again, from the perspective of Nova, placement can be used to track things other than compute nodes and compute node inventory, but we're simplifying here. Um, I'm focusing on resource providers, things that provide resources that are compute nodes. So there's three things that I kind of want to look at here, actually four. Um, vCPU and pCPU, vCPU being uh, floating unpinned uh, instances or instance cores, memory MB, which is uh, how we track our memory consumption and memory availability, and then a final one which isn't listed here, which is disk GB, which is how we track availability of disk. And then from the traits perspective, again, these are things that the compute node is. Uh, there's, there's a whole load of these. Um, the three I have listed here, the first one demonstrates uh, that this compute node is able to support emulated TPM devices. The second reports that the compute node is able to support AMD SEV memory encryption. And then the final one uh, reports that the hypervisor in this case is able to support uh, instances that request the Vertio um, disk bus via image metadata property, for example. So problem number one, um, when it comes to the liver driver. Liver has two different ways of thinking about CPUs. So for since we're at the Metallica cycle, we've supported this idea of CPU policies, which allow you to say, instead of my instance floating across all cores on any given host, I want to delegate, dedicate rather, a specific cores from that host to the instance. And no other instance should be allowed to use those cores. That's configured via um, a couple of config options. These replace older deprecated uh, config options um, listed here on the screen. And from the actual LiveVert driver perspective, again, LiveVert just cares about XML blobs. That's implemented with something that looks kind of this. Not really all that relevant to, to the discussion here, but useful to know. So there's a whole load of uh, potential gotchas with using this feature and things that will impact your ability to, uh, to schedule instances. So the first of these is that in older versions of Nova, um, there was nothing to restrict uh, shared CPUs from, from treading all over the dedicated CPUs. So we pinned delegated CPUs using that XML blob that I showed in the previous slide, showing now. But we didn't do any such thing for shared CPUs, which makes sense because you, you'd have to continuously re-pin your shared instances as you booted a, a pinned a dedicated instance. But it did mean that you had to use um, something like host aggregates to separate CPUs. Another thing that we saw was um, you have this idea for CPU of uh, overcommit ratios. When you're using pinned CPUs, those overcommit ratios don't apply. So you'll have done your, your configuration, you'll have expected your, your CPUs to overcommit by 10, for example. You have 10 whole CPUs, therefore you should be able to boot um, 100 instance CPUs or boot enough instances to consume 100 instance CPUs. 
That doesn't happen with pinned instances because again, no other instance can share them except for the misbehaving shared TPUs. And then finally, there were a whole load of woes and, and misery around live migration, typically caused, or actually entirely caused by our inability at the time to recalculate this, uh, this XML blob. So you would live migrate your instance to, um, to another compute node and it would stay using the pinning uh, on the previous compute node, which was fine if you saw a nice clean failure where uh, those CPUs just weren't available. So you, you pin to you know, cores 19 and 20 of uh, one host and then the other host only had 16 cores, you'd see a nice clean failure. But if you didn't see that, then there was a good chance that you'd end up like uh, scheduled over other cores. The recommendations uh, to avoid all of these issues when it comes to scheduling uh, mishaps, please, please use the newest versions of Nova, uh, train or later, because these have improved how we do pin CPUs like significantly. In train, we introduced this idea of PCPUs, uh, which are something that you can't overcommit. They're a completely different uh, info inventory type. And they give you the ability to boot pinned and unpinned instances on the same compute node by maintaining two distinct pools of, uh, of CPUs. On top of that, this is, this is seen as one of those advanced features that you should really only use if you actually need it. Typically, if you were to enable um, guess new topologies or something we'll touch on later, they'll give you quite uh, almost as much of a performance improvement um, as using pinning itself, or simply just go and lower, lower your overcommit ratios. Uh, I do neither of those things using uh, the newest version of uh, Nova or using an alternative thing should help minimize the amount of issues you'll see where you either won't be able to schedule to a host because it will fail uh, late in the process, or you'll be able to schedule, but it actually isn't doing what you think it's doing under the hood. And just like CPUs, memory has the exact same problem. Not all memory is the same from the liver driver perspective. So again, this is, this is another one of those advanced features. And if you're, you're not talking in terms of high performance workloads or anything, you might never have even encountered this. But Livert understands huge pages and the implications of, of huge pages, for instances. So for anyone that hasn't encountered huge pages before, they are simply larger memory pages. Um, there's massive uh, performance benefits to be had from using huge pages wisely, um, particularly for things that, that consume large amounts of memory. But uh, as we're going to see in a moment, there's, there's some downsides to using them. The way you'd actually use that is enabling this extra spec. On top of that, you also have different types of, um, we'll say disk space, so memory and also storage. So um, you can use in recent versions of Nova, uh, something like an SSD to actually do the backing of your memory. So instead of using system RAM, you can use a, a file on a disk, so file back memory, uh, as this example shows. Uh, and that obviously has impacts in, in tracking and inventory management and stuff uh, for this stuff. And again, bringing it all back, this is all stuff that can cause like no valid host error conditions. So potential gotchas from a high level of um, memory consumption and kind of the weirdness that Livert can do with memory consumption. Typically, if you're using anything other than standard pages, you're giving up the ability to swap and you're giving up the ability to overcommit. So even if you have overcommit configured uh, on the host, it will just be blankly ignored. Um, and you'll see that unfortunately not from placement because placement will return your allocation candidates, but rather later on in the scheduler, as we're going to see in a moment. Um, from that perspective, uh, from that point, counting of huge pages and standard pages tends to be quite poor. Um, Liver, even now, doesn't actually support tracking um, huge pages in placement. Uh, 
the livery driver that is, which means that uh, placement only actually still understands memory MB as a unit. The end goal for this is to implement something akin to what we've done with vCPU and pCPU, where they are separate resources, but it just hasn't happened yet. And then again, as with using dedicated CPUs, there are a whole load of, of woes and misery and pain to be had um, with live migration if, if it isn't thought out properly ahead of time. Um, even down to like, not quite data loss, but like out of memory killers running on the host and, and deleting instances on you, uh, it can be quite bad. So the recommendations we have for this is to use, firstly, Nova 19 Rocky or newer. There's a whole load of fixes around huge pages and stuff in here. They were backported to earlier releases, but this is the first version with, with all of them uh, in from the get-go. And something that we no longer have to recommend, thankfully, for CPUs, but we still do if you're using different types of memory backing, are host aggregates. So if you have hosts where you're using something like fileback memory or you're using huge pages, use host aggregates to separate those different types of hosts. Um, not doing this is just setting yourself up for misery um, from, the, from the scheduling perspective and also just uh, things like I said, out of memory killers and stuff running in the background. And then forgetting about uh, CPU and RAM and disk going down is kind of the more low level stuff. There are differences between the different hypervisors that Liver supports, um, the advanced functionality that you can enable, the like, differences if that's enabled on one host and not on another. Uh, and then the actual host platform itself, you have an Intel processor in one platform and you don't have it in another, you have an AMD chip. So things like this, different host CPUs have different features, um, enabling advanced functionality selectively on one host and not another can break stuff, that kind of thing. And again, live migration is one of the areas where you're, you're typically going to, to see a lot of misery. Again, no valid host on this. Um, you might see it if, for example, you're, you're doing things that placement supports. Uh, like requesting a particular image type that isn't supported by your hypervisor because we report that stuff in placement now. You might also see it coming up in scheduler filters later. Uh, we're going to touch on scheduler filters in a moment. But um, th th there's just a whole load of different ways that enabling these things and especially doing different things on different hosts can just cause, cause misery. So don't do it. Basically, that's our lesson here. Um, prefer um, homogeneity where possible. If you're going to mix and match in hosts, either make sure that, that you can boot hosts and that they'll correctly schedule, or boot instances rather, and they'll correctly schedule to the right hosts. Um, or ideally use host aggregates again, like I said, to separate the, the different kind of workloads into different hosts. And as always, with all this stuff, you test it because there's only so much stuff that we can actually test in the gate. And unfortunately, a lot of these advanced features tend to slip under the radar. We have tried to close those gaps in recent years, but there is only so much that we can actually test without um, spending days and days testing each individual patch. So if you're interested in a particular feature, um, test it in a lab and make sure that it works and then slowly start scaling it up. So that's placement. The last of the, the three components to consider are the filters. Again, there's there's a load of filters here, just like the weighers, um, but there's only a couple of these that are actually going to perform differently based on the, uh, the back end. I'm going to talk about two of those, um, the two kind of things that I know best and the two that are probably going to cause the most heartache from a deployment perspective. And that will also cause um, the most kind of no valid host errors. First of those is the Numa topology filter. Um, all that that and the PCI filter are doing is they're, uh, they're basically taking th these two objects that aren't really relevant at the moment and they're, they're doing some conditional checks on those and they're, they're returning uh, a Boolean value of true or false depending on whether the host is acceptable or not. The Numa topology filter is the thing that's responsible for enforcing Numa affinity. 
Um, for anyone that hasn't dealt with Numo before, it is the thing that um, allows you to have multi basically multiple memory controllers on a compute node. Um, the reason that Numo is important is that uh, where you have multiple memory controllers and a compute node, and you have um, instances running on uh, talk on a CPU that's talking to one memory controller, trying to access memory on the other, uh, on another memory controller can incur uh, latency, like performance impacts. That's enforced with liver. That's still not that relevant at the moment, but Numa itself has um, implications for a massive amount of kind of more advanced features within Nova and the Livvert driver, uh, such as those listed here. So it is unfortunately, or fortunately, quite a, a big uh, topic and a big thing that you need to think about um, when you're deploying OpenStack. Issues with the Numa topology filter, firstly, um, it's racy. So filters in general tend to be racy. And doing things like spamming multiple requests means that the Numa topology filter might uh, allow multiple requests to use an instance or to use a host, and you'll get late failures. Um, there's also a whole lot of like little bugs that are in the background for a few years. We've worked on closing a lot of these off, like the inability to live migrate and stuff in recent releases, but um, some of these still exist. Our recommendations for minimizing damage when it comes to uh, uh, the Numa topology filter are try to limit um, the amount of spawn requests or increase the amount of retries that uh, an instance is able to make uh, if possible. And again, if you've got different compute nodes with different capabilities, use host aggregates to separate them. The other one uh, of the, the two that I want to talk about is the PCI pass-through filter. Um, for this, we can only really say that we're sorry. Um, it is a miserable, miserable thing to configure, and we fully realize that. Uh, it's hard to debug. Uh, move operations don't tend to work all that well. Um, it turns out that attaching and detaching a PCI device is about the only way you can actually move these things around, and that is indeed how recent versions of Nova allow you to do SRIOV based instances live migration. But again, like the Numa topology filter, it's also racy. Um, it'll frequently give you a compute node that uh, doesn't actually have any PCI devices left if you try to boot multiple instances at the same time. Um, that kind of thing. And recommendations wise, We've done a lot of work in kind of bug fixing here in recent releases. Uh, train is a good, good starting point. This is the release that also introduced the ability to, for example, live migrate um, instances with their SRIOV PCI based NICs. We also recommend that if you're using PCI devices that you start with a very small deployment, get things working and build up from there. Um, Nova supports the ability to have multiple devices with kind of different configuration and stuff. But owing to how complex this thing is and how hard it is to debug, um, starting small will make your life a lot easier. And then finally, be prepared to go and unfortunately hack on the code a small bit and add additional logging. This is an area where, where logging and debugging has historically been quite difficult. And if you happen to hit upon something, please let us know because it's, it's an area that we'd like to improve. Going forward, we're hoping to move some of this stuff into placement, um, which should decrease the amount of kind of no valid host errors that you'll see when using the PCI pass-through filter. But that's a, that's a long road and it'll take a, a couple of cycles to get there. So uh, a quick wrap up of uh, the things that I've been talking about quite rapidly. So the liver driver is complex, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your use case. And because of that, there are a great load of kind of edge cases, corner cases, outright bugs that you're likely to encounter when using it. To minimize those, um, using like a homogenous uh, deployment will unfortunately just make your life a lot easier. Uh, enabling features across all compute nodes using similar um, types of instances even will just make life easier. Uh, if you can't do that, 
we highly recommend using host aggregates to break up your data center or your deployments into more manageable chunks. Move operations are the things that are most likely to break. You'll attempt to move something and it won't be able to find a compute node, or if it does, when you boot the instance there, it won't actually boot successfully. Um, so these are the things that we recommend you test. And in general, we recommend starting small and testing these things as thoroughly as possible. And that is the magic of the live driver, um, a veritable wish list of, of bugs that we would like to fix at some point in the future. Hopefully that's beneficial and will help you understand some of these more advanced features in Nova and why they're performing funkily. And we'd recommend, or we'd love if you actually got in touch with uh, the Nova developers if you encounter these and have stumbled upon strategies or even fixes to help uh, mitigate their impact. Other than that, thank you very much for your time and um, I'll get back to looking at the rain out the window.